we're going tribal today with a company that has grown 10x in two and a half years. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host today, back by popular demand, Mr. Justin Welsh. He is the VP of Sales of a company called Patient Pop. Uh, I had him on two and a half years ago. Back then, they were doing uh, $5 million with 50 employees. Now, they're doing over $50 million with just over 400 employees, and over 25% of them are sales. So this is my kind of guy. He was uh, very open and honest, uh, as all my guests are, um, and we've even had conversations afterwards. He's inspiring me to pursue a couple of things, so we'll get into that uh, probably in the uh, post-production, in the uh, outro, as they call it. But um, you know, we get down to how is he building this company? What kind of culture? Why is that so important? Uh, how is he doing it? So you are in for a treat. Um, I'm recording this intro the week after Traffic and Conversion Summit. Uh, That was a good conference down in San Diego, uh, put on by the digital marketer guys. I am leaving later this morning for Austin, going to a small, intimate two-day workshop down in South Austin. So uh, I'll have some info for you on that, some lessons learned uh, when I return. But the interesting thing about Traffic and conversion, you know, it was huge. Thousands. I've heard 5,000, I've heard 7,000. I know it's moving to the uh, San Diego Convention Center next year. Uh, This was its 10th year anniversary. But they know how to put on a show. Tons of vendors. And I know the the booth sponsors pay a crap ton of money. uh, Because I know some people who stopped promoting there. But they they add value. There's not a bunch of pitching from the stage. Uh, People give great content. Uh, but it's still about the relationships. You know, I didn't go into a single session. I uh, spent three days catching up with people, uh, brainstorming ideas, uh, getting, you know, the Cliff Notes version from smart people. Uh, podcasting is here to stay. It is not even close to reaching its peak. So if you've been considering it, jump in. The water is still warm uh, and really going to get better. Uh, there's some big things happening with some big players. Um making moves to index shows to run paid sponsorship during the shows where you can monetize kind of like a YouTube channel. So it could be good, could be bad, but uh, it just shows that there's a focus, there's still an emphasis uh, and a desire for this medium. You know, I look at my own numbers, you know, January was my biggest month. February was just off of that. Um, you know, it was a shorter month. I still did the same number of episodes, but, um, you know, sometimes they're a little bit up, sometimes a little bit down, but it's still, the trend is up. Uh, I'm excited about 2019 and beyond, um, but I get a lot more downloads of my podcast than I get visitors to my website. Uh, and how else can you spend 30 minutes to an hour, you know, however much time your podcast is, how, how can you spend that much time in the ears of your ideal prospects? So I say it's a great medium. You need to be doing more video as well. I'm guilty of not doing enough video in the last year or so. Uh, I'll be working on changing that immediately. You know, you've got to recognize where your prospects are and get there, right? Put your message in front of them. Video is important. Audio is important. You know, the written word still works, but the numbers I've seen is that it's the long form content, longer form content. Um, more epic blog posts, right, in the 1,500 to 2,000 word range. I've seen it kind of falls off after that level, you know, so you don't need to do a 10,000 word blog post, but to hit the sweet spot, at least be 1,200 words up to 1,500 and capping out around 2,000. So I've been working this last year at least on consolidating old posts. I did one on social media. I think I had 13 blog posts about social media on my website going back, you know, 10 years. And I combined all of them into one big uh, blog post, which has done a lot better. Being actually, I got an email last week on it from somebody that had read it. So put out better content, focus on quality over quantity in this new year. Okay. It's still kind of new early March, but, um, 
that's where you need to be spending your time. All right. You got to you got to change as the markets change. But still understand, at the end of the day, we're human beings trying to connect with other human beings who have the same fears and worries, doubts, uh, same goals and aspirations. So speak to those and you'll be fine. Okay? Um, Check out the Make Every Sale program. If you want to hang out with me, ask questions literally anytime. Uh, I answer them as soon as I see them. Uh, We do a live weekly call as well, uh, recorded, where I can help you help yourself. And it's the most affordable option I have um, for helping you grow your sales. All right. So check that out. Makeeverysale.com. Now let's bring on our guest. Justin Welsh is back all grown up. Is that what you just told me before I hit record, man? I'm a grown, I'm a grown up person from uh, <laughs> the last time we spoke. How are you, Wes? I'm good. Welcome back, man. Fellow SoCal dude. Yep. So uh, it was so funny. You know, you were like, yeah, man, two and a half years ago. I mean, we were a little company you know, at 50. Well, yeah. It's a good size company for sure. entrepreneurs and, and most companies. I mean, 50 is solid, but, but uh, you've had a little bit of growth in the last two and a half years, huh? Yeah, that's right, man. I think the last time you and I spoke, Patient Pop was just about 50, 50 people. We're, we're upwards of over 400 today. I think my sales team was, I don't know, 10 or 12 or 14 deep and we've crossed the 100 person mark and grown like wildfire. We uh, roughly around, I don't know, three or five million in recurring revenue last time you and I caught up. And if all things keep chugging along, we'll we'll finish this quarter just short of 50. So a lot of growth, been super, super exciting and uh, I'm still alive to, to talk about it. So your recurring revenue is is fifty million a quarter or per year? No, per year. We'll uh, we'll be we'll be at fifty million in in live uh, recurring revenue uh, at the end of this quarter. So yeah, oh, nice. yep. <clears throat> so so just real quick, just so our listeners know, we don't have to get into detail, but sure. what what is Patient Pop? Yeah, Patient Pop is really the first all in one practice growth platform. So essentially, we help physician practices and doctors' offices acquire new patients, streamline their front office, and really modernize the patient experience. So one of the easiest ways to think about it, and I know this is probably pretty relevant to you, is it's like HubSpot for doctors, right? You buy buy Patient Pop, you turn it on, and all their marketing inbound and outbound taken care of. That's nice. So that opens the door to a few things. Um, When, so it's kind of a, a business in a box in a way. Is that sure. fair? Yeah, I think the, the challenge that doctors have really faced over the course of their lives and careers is, you know, there's a lot of software out there. And most of that software that they buy are, is point solutions. It's, you know, they buy a website here, a mobile app here, you know, reputation management here, SEO from another vendor. And by the time you, they're done, they're working with seven, eight, nine different vendors or spending 40,000 bucks. And they got a million people that, they're, uh, that are accountable to them. And uh, when something breaks, you, you kind of don't know what it is. So our goal was really to put that all under one umbrella and offer it up to physician practices at a low cost subscription price. And that's what we've done. And it's really resonated in the market, hence, hence the growth. So when so I got to imagine over two and a half years, the, the product has probably evolved, right? The, sure. the, the suite of solutions that come in that box. Yep. Um, when do you know that you have an MVP, right? A minimum viable product. When, when yeah. do you know that it's, that you have something? And then how do you know when to add the next widget, you know, without like outpacing yeah. yourself? Yeah, I think, um, I think once you have a pretty consistent sales process in the early on, right? I think when I, when I work with lots of other founders, what I hear is like, we got lucky. We, we got one customer and we, we're not sure why. And then we got a second customer and maybe we're not sure why. I think it's once you're getting customers consistently early on and you have a process and you understand why that's happening. I think you can understand that there's, there's product market fit. You have a, a product that customers will at least buy on a regular basis with a regular process. I think to me, that's like the biggest indicator that you have at least a, a minimum viable product, right? Hey, we went out, we picked up 10, 15, 20 customers in the same length the time saying the same things, demonstrating the same stuff. To, to me, that's like a, a really big indicator. And I would say in terms of adding new features and functionality to our product, we listen to our customers, 
right? So we're going out and we're, we're doing NPS surveys. We're, we're getting customers together in the form of, you know, survey teams. And really, we're just asking our customers what they want and why. And anytime that we can see that there's a point solution in the marketplace that isn't serving their needs or they need better functionality and it fits in with our suite of products, then we'll, we'll look at doing that as long as it fits into our core mission of helping practices thrive. So that, that's the easiest way for us to figure out when the next module is needed. So how often are you telling your client, basically sit down, shut up, do it this way, right? Because this, yeah. I love the analogy HubSpot, you know, yeah. doctors, because I'm, I'm getting more involved. Like I'm talking to people, oh, but I, the CMS is different, but I like, I can manipulate WordPress, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. why you're getting in trouble. Yeah. Because you're dicking around with things. Yep instead of just letting the software do its thing so you can focus on what you do. So is that a hard conversation? Sometimes. Um, I would say the, the really interesting thing, and I've been selling to physician practice my whole life. That's all I've done since I graduated school. And the really interesting thing is the way that doctors learn is through education. So if you think about a doctor or a physician going through their lives, they're generally 4.0 students. They're at the top of their class. Then they go off to medical school. And the way that they learn is going through residency and fellowship. And when you go through those two things, you get lectured, right? You have an expert standing up on stage or in a surgical suite, uh, lecturing you, teaching you how to do things. So when it comes to marketing, search engine optimization, uh, doctors are pretty self-aware that they're not the experts. So and oftentimes when they get on a conversation with us, they're actually looking for guidance. They're not there to say, I want to do something this way. This is the way I do things and you have to fit into my box. It's like, hey, patient pop, help. Uh, I, I, I'm a good doctor, but I can't get you know, my brand online to do what I wanted to do. And, and what do you recommend? So we're very expertise driven as a team. We, we go out there and we educate the market. We make them aware. And when they get on a demonstration, I mean, we're pretty stern and straightforward in our recommendations. Um, we're, we're there to basically tell them what we think they should be doing from our vantage point. Well, so that opens another can of worms. Sure. I mean, how it, it's great if they're calling you, right? Yeah. That puts you in a position yeah. of strength. Uh, so is that how, is, are the bulk of your leads inbound? Are they outbound? You know, yeah, how I do know. you create these teed up opportunities? Yeah, I would love to say they were all inbound. That would be, that would be great. Um, <laughs> and and a, a majority of them are, right? We, we, we'd probably do, I don't know, 25 to 35% of our revenue, our new bookings in, in inbound marketing. Um, but, but no, we have to go out there and we have, to, we have to find these doctors. And the easiest way to do it is by educating them on those pain points. So, um, you know, the, the way that we do that is we know what our solution is really good at doing. It's it's great at driving new patient acquisition. It's great at fixing reputation. So we go out there and we look for physicians that we think aren't doing a very good job at that, right? And then we'll, we'll put them into an outbound cadence. We'll, we'll help them uh, feel that pain and we'll offer up our solution. So um, outbound, while it's not as fun as inbound, is a major part of our, our sales organization. And then the last part of sort of getting them educated when they're not coming inbound is through really, really strong channel partners. And, you know, there's a million companies out there selling commoditized products to physician practices and they want to leg up and they know that their physician practices want to grow. So they, they lay on patient pop. They, they lean on us and say, Hey, let's, let's get your suite of products in there so that when I sell my products and help you grow your, help the physicians grow their practice, we're, we're more of a value add. We're a better partner to that physician. So we lean on channel partners and they lean on us. So there's a lot of different ways that we kind of attack the market. So you talk about education and yeah. And that's always important, but it's also time consuming. Uh, it can be complex. You know, are you having the salespeople educate? Or is the marketing department like creating yeah. the content, letting, and maybe, you know, I'm on a call and I'm like, well, hey, Justin, you know, are you online? You go to this URL and, and let them get educated on their own time. Great question. Yeah. So our marketing department really does a great job of warming up sort of the awareness of, of problem. So we'll, we'll get out there and we'll make physicians aware. If you don't have a good online reputation, you're gonna lose. 
if people can't find your website, you're going to lose, right? If hospital systems are coming into your neighborhood and buying up private practices and you want to stay private, it's not going to happen unless you, you do a good job of, of marketing your practice. So we're educating them on the pain side, on, on the, the downfalls. Uh, that, that's for marketing, right? Once we've educated them on that pain, they come into the sales department and we, we do most of the awareness and education on the solution. And we don't do a lot of slick, glossy education. Like we get in the weeds. We show them how search engine optimization works, how websites work, how conversion rates work. We're really opening up the hood and showing them how those things work and why they need a technology solution like ours to, to power their practice. So it's a great tandem relationship between myself and uh, my peer on the marketing side, Jared Jost. We, we do a great job kind of being uh, buddy, buddy on that. So that, that's how we approach that. How do you know when to get in the weeds yeah. and, and not get lost, right? You can get bogged down. Sure. You get one of these analytical types, yep. right? And you can get into a 48 hours, like a Jerry Lewis telethon. You know, it's like, yep. dude, I, gotta, I haven't seen my family in a week. I got to go home. I need to end this demo. Yeah. You know, how, do you, how do you balance that, right? Getting into the weeds, giving them the details, yeah. but converting it to a sale. Yeah, you know, it may sound really simple, but we ask. Um, oftentimes, physicians are, by, by nature, really curious people. They're really smart people. And they like to know why things work, right? Doctors don't, they're not hypothetical. Um, they're not theoretical. They like to know why something works the way that it does. And that's the way that they've been trained. So oftentimes when we open up a, a demonstration, we'll say like, hey man, we're going to go through this and give you sort of the 30,000 foot view. And if anything that we say peaks interest, doesn't make sense, sounds, sounds fishy, whatever, whatever lingo you want to use, like let's, let's dive deep and, and open up the hood and take an in-depth look at it. At it. And it, it would surprise you how long a lot of our demos are, especially for our sales cycle. We're, we're an 8.6 day sales cycle. Um, so we're quick turnaround, but these doctors, they want to know, they want to learn, they want to be a part of understanding what they're buying and, and why what they're buying works. So a lot of times we just ask and we, uh, we're, we're happy to, to show them because the team is well-trained. Yeah. So, so is it safe to say you, you get into the weeds, but only, on the points that the client wants to look at. That's right. And, yeah. but, but realistically that may only be 10 or 20% of the solution. Totally. hundred okay. percent. I got, I got guys in, 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 uh, in ladies going down and doing, you know, 15 minute demos. And yeah. then, uh, oftentimes you'll get a different type of physician on the phone and we're going hours. Sure. So, and especially if we're getting the C-suite in and doing a larger deal. I mean, we're talking about, I've run demos that are two and a half hours long over the course of my career. So, you know, we, we can go, go really deep. But at this point in time, we kind of have it laid out where most, most of the time we need about 30 minutes and we're getting buy-in from, from the doctors. Is it, is it a high ticket sale? Is it like a long contract? I mean, is it, is it 8.6 days is super fast. So super fast. Yeah. Average, average contract, 13K. Uh, 12 month commitment paid monthly. Um, you know, we, we have like a $600 a month license per physician. So right. each physician's paying about 7,200 bucks a month and is taking care of all their marketing. So if you look at the point solutions added up, we're, we're pretty much a steal. Okay. You lost me there. 600, but then 7,200. So are they buying multiple yeah. licenses? No, sorry. Sorry about that. It's 600 a month. So 7,200 a year for a physician to join. They just pay monthly. Right. And um, th there's a bunch of suite of services they can add on, which is oh, why our gotcha. contract value is a little higher. They can add social media, retention marketing, email marketing, and, and oftentimes they'll, they'll end up spending, you know, roughly 10, 12, 13K a, a year with us. Are, are you typically displacing something or is it like a green field? Like they're not doing it and they need to do it. Displacement. Yep. Usually it's, um, I'm working with, you know, Wix for my website and I'm working with an online booking solution that's I'm jamming in trying to integrate with my back office systems and I'm running reputation ads on Yelp and I'm, you know, doing PPC on Google and we're coming in and displacing those four things for a more cost effective price. Nice. Yep. Um, so how have you, I mean, growing from what, 50 to 400 people in, yep. in two and a half years is significant. And then, so from a sales perspective, like what's the headcount growth? 
Yeah, we've gone from when, when you and I last talked, we were probably at 10 or 12, maybe 15 people. Um, but now we're at about about 100. I think last I checked, we're at about 105 uh, people. And, you know, that breaks down. sales? Yeah, 105 salespeople, yeah. Nice. So basically 25% of the company? Yeah. Yeah, we're a big, yeah, big, baby. big sales organization. <laughs> yeah. We've, uh, Are they all inside or do they live in their territories? Yeah, great, great question there. It's, it's kind of all over the place. And um, I'll kind of walk you through it quickly. We, we've got about 35 sales development reps. So those, those guys and girls making inbound and outbound calls, taking, you know, qualifying the inbound demos. I've got, I think, 25 inside sales closers. Um, I've got a team of about 20 that work with our strategic channel partners because we work with quite a few partners. And then uh, I have around 30 people uh, out in the field who are really uh, there to move up market. So some of those larger groups like larger ortho groups or derm groups or you know, primary care doctor groups. So they're, they're stationed in the, the big major metro areas, New York, LA, you know, Atlanta, Houston, Dallas. You can probably guess the rest. And uh, that, that's kind of the way that we attack the market and the inside team fills in the gaps. Do you have a uh, unique hiring process? Have you found a little, any kind of secrets to finding good talent? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of letting, uh, learning from people who have done it before me. Uh, that, that's kind of my, my mantra is like, if it exists, then let's, let's follow that that protocol and try and make it better. And, you know, the, the guy whose protocol I've always followed is Mark Robert from HubSpot. Actually, it's, he's got, um, you know, curious, coachable, prior performance, work ethic, and, uh, and intelligence. Those are the five key traits that he looks for. And um, I don't differ too much from those things, but what I'm also really focused on and what has always worked really well for me in my career is I, I care about action over academia. Like there's a certain level of competency you have to have to work at Patient Pop and sell a robust product to physicians, but I'm about action. I'm about getting stuff done. I'm about moving fast and putting numbers on paper. So when someone can come in holding a, a boatload of trophies or a boatload of recommendations or a bunch of uh, documents that say he or she has been at the top of the leaderboard, like I'm action-based. So um, I don't try and take uh, aggressive job seekers. We try and, and go after those who are passive, those who are already in a company like ours, killing it and wooing them away uh, to the best of our ability. So um, that, that has been what has served me well. And the best way to do that is to get big time recruiters. Uh, I, I know you're a, a college football uh, guy, you know, to get, you know, the Les Miles, the Urban Myers, the Nick Sabans on your team, like working for you, going out and getting those players. And I have those. I, I just brought Kevin Dorsey over from Service Titan here in Los Angeles. He's one of the most well-known sales recruiters who's a, a leadership guy. He's the VP of inside sales for me. And, you know, we're, we're going after A plus talent that, that already works somewhere else. And, and that's how we build our business. Now I know why you haven't called me. That makes sense. You've got standards, so that's all good. Um, so, yeah, so that's awesome. Um, and then, so you you onboard them. I mean, you, you get these people. <clears throat> you, like, how are you arming them mm -hmm. to, because especially guys in the field. Yep. Uh, are they literally knocking on doors? Are yeah. they, um you know, because that's a special animal. Yeah. Right. Somebody nowadays willing to go solicit at a business. Yep. Um, two, two very different people, right? right. Um, for me, like I worked in the field for 10 years, so I know what that guy or girl looks like. And oftentimes it's it's your lone it's your lone wolf personality type. It's the like, give me the tools that I need, give me a give me a manual, give me some intranet where I can learn about the product and away I go. And it's really challenging to identify those, those folks, but um, we've got a pretty good process. Max Kim Brown runs my field team and he's an, he's an animal, been in the field for 15 years and running big teams. So he's got a great process for identifying really strong field salespeople. And in, in inside, it's tribal training. Um, you know, Kevin brought over this incredible tribal training uh, that he runs where 
not only is it sales training and enablement that's allowing these folks to learn everything they need to learn in the first two weeks on the job, but it's extended training 30, 60, and 90 days out through uh, really access to subject matter experts, SMEs, top performers, departmental leaders. They are literally in the patient pop swimming pool for the first 90 days are just soaking up everything they can possibly soak up. And they're not just doing it from a trainer. They're not just doing it from a sales leader. They're getting it from everybody, from every angle, from every department. And if you've heard me speak before, like I very much attempt to connect their performance to those people in the organization who depend on them. And when they meet those folks and when they spend time with them, like that connection gets that much stronger. And that's why I think, you know, I've lost two top performers in four years and one of them just recently came back. And I think people feel really connected to the rest of the organization here at Patient Bob. Are you commission heavy? Yeah, we are commission heavy. Sure. And um, we, we believe that, um, boy, what's the best way to say this? I believe top performers should rob from bottom um, I don't love compensation plans that start paying people at dollar one and, and um, you know, hey, you hit 33% of quota, but you, you made enough money to go home and be super comfortable to work, you know, the next two years at Patient Pop. I want my top performers, you know, driving, driving sports cars and I want my bottom performers self-selecting out. And, you know, in today's world, that might not be the message that resonates that well, but that's, that's the reality of, of what it's like to work here. Yes. <laughs> Whoa, I got a little, I, I, hold on, I need to pause for a minute. I, can I get a tissue, honey? Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> That's the way to do it, man. I mean, look, all this pie in the sky, socialism, whatever, it's great on paper, but eventually you run out of other people's money, you know, and capitalism works. So, yeah. And I, and you know what, man, like I love everybody who works at patient pop. I truly do. And, um, but the bond that I have with uh, the men and women who have come and worked for our organization and put in like every piece of effort they can and become top performers, like we're that much closer, not just as coworkers, but as, as friends, like in family. And, and right. that, that to me is really important. And I think you build a really strong organization that way. Now, how strict are you with your processes, your script? Like mm -hmm. you onboard these people, particularly maybe your, your SDRs, your inside sales, Yeah, you know, cause the lone wolf, I know you maybe give a little bit of leniency, a little latitude, but, um, you know, inside and SDRs, are you like, Hey, this is the patient pop way, you know, do it this way or it's the highway or do you, you know, give yeah. them a, a, it's a great question. Um, in the beginning, sort of, uh, I guess is probably not the most clear or clean answer, but um, yes, we have best practices, right? We have recommended ways of doing things. Here's the way that I think about it in a nutshell. If you come into patient pop and say, I'm not going to do anything that you recommend and you fail, that's, not, that's on you, right? We have yeah. recommended best practices. We have scripting. We have things you have to do, meet, you know, meets minimum expectations in our role. But I can think of a few uh, people in my organization that have come in, followed what they were supposed to do, done well, and then tweaked it, right? Yeah. Become very different from our best practices. And here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to box someone in uh, because I think the way that I do things is right or the way Kevin does things is right. We want to let people grow and shine in their own way. And I can think of a lot of people in my, my company right now that do things very differently and are on the top of the leaderboard. So uh, it's, it's inflexible uh, at the beginning and it's as flexible as you want to be as long as, you're, uh, as long as you're doing well. As long as you're producing. Yeah. That's and right. that's like my, my second job after being unemployed when I left the Air Force, you know, was selling mobile homes, man. And they had a process. I followed that process. Yep. Right. I mean, to see, like, I got a, I got a wife, I had a baby and I had a brand new baby. I was on unemployment when I got my, that job. Uh, I was, well, I was on unemployment when my son, second son was born. So, and man, it was like, I got to eat. I got to put food on the table. And they're like, here's the process. So I will follow that process. You yeah. Know? And I yeah. was, I mean, I was top, top 2% out of like 2000 salespeople my first year, you know, then after the first year, you know, I modified it. I put my own flavor to it, but it was, it was still 90% that process. 
Yeah, it's like it's like any it's like any sport, right? There's there's ways to do things that that thousands of people have done before you that are best practice. And that doesn't mean you don't get someone who runs a little differently or swings a little differently. And uh, and that's the way that we think about it. But I often tell people when they come in and they don't want to find like what I see a lot is I made three calls with your script and it didn't work and I'm ready to bail. And that's just right. like it, listen, we're not teaching something that's worked or that hasn't worked for these, these hundred people sitting around you. We're, we're right. teaching you it because it, it works and we want to get these, these folks into a place where their career is growing. So yeah, yeah go make 300. That's then right. We might talk, you know, but <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, you know, I was, I was one of those pushing back, you know, back in the day because the script and the process was usually as a bad script. It was robotic. It was crap. Yeah. You know, it was not human. Uh, but I tell people all the time, it's like, how much money did The Rock or Oprah or Tom Cruise make last year, right? I mean, you, you add those three people together and it's, I don't know, a quarter billion dollars, you know, and what do they do for a living? You know, they read a script, you know, <laughs> sure. they, they ask questions, pre-written questions, you know, researched and, and written down in advance. That's their job, you Wish know. It works for them, so it probably worked for you, knucklehead Absolutely. salesperson. But don't get me – I was crying a minute ago. Now I'm angry. How would you do this to me, man? What hey. You get like some NLP voodoo going on over there? I, I got to say, man, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, it's always fun, though, when I do learn from like someone who makes a, makes a tweak or an adjustment um, because – Things, in my opinion, like sales is an ever-flowing, ever-changing game. What, what worked in 2018 may not work in 2019 and, and most likely won't work in 2020. So my, my thing is to kind of keep my eyes and ears peeled. And if I see a, a young man or young woman doing a better, better job than, than I did or than our top performers are doing by doing something a little bit differently, hell, like let's, let's capture that, right? Let's get that on paper. Let's get that on video. And so we, we want to be as flexible as possible to the extent that it's working. So what, how do you reach a physician today? I mean, if <laughs> yeah. I had to guess, I'd probably say he's not, he's not hanging out on Instagram, you know, looking for a sponsored post. Uh, That's right. Although I could be wrong. I mean, if they're a younger doctor. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of like Instagram, but you know, yeah. what, what does, how, how, where are C-level executives high income or affluent earners, you know, where, where are they hanging out? You know, what we're starting to see is that we're, healthcare is always just slightly behind everybody else in terms of their engagement on technology. Dude, I know and, my doctor was putting leeches on me the other day. I, right. Didn't that crap go out like a few hundred years ago? It's, it's literally exactly true. <laughs> like we're, we're, so we, we have to think a little bit differently than other marketing and sales teams. And that's not to, that's not um, saying anything bad about the healthcare space or anything like that. It's just, they're generally thinking a bit differently. So we have a lot of success with PPC, right? Like we have a lot of people clicking on ad, uh, AdWords. We, we do a lot of programmatic display campaigns. So we're out there making sure that we're following the physicians and their group practices around nearly every website that they spend time on. If you look at patientpop.com once, it's going to follow you on YouTube for the rest of your life, basically. So we're seeing that, but really it goes back to that education and that consuming of, of knowledge, that consumption of knowledge. So we actually put out a lot of really uh, solid white papers on how to be successful online. So whether it's reputation or whether it's SEO or whether it's simply running a more efficient and effective practice, you can come to patientpop.com or you're going to find it online being distributed through partners, studies, uh, things that look like other stuff doctors are already reading in their spare time. Uh, that, that to us is the easiest way to get eyeballs on paper it is through great white papers, great studies and around the web. Is the doctor filling this out on their own? Are they sending their office manager? You know, are they using a real email address? Yeah. Or are they still trying to play hard to get? No, it's, it, it's pretty straightforward. Usually um, doctors want to talk to us. Uh, they want to understand what they're doing poorly, what they're doing well, and how to improve. Now, it doesn't mean we don't talk to office managers, administrators, spouses. I mean, we talk to them all the time. Um, but, you know, generally the doctor wants to come on and see where they are failing. And um, that, that's a great thing for us, right? The more we can talk to, to doctors, the more 
you know, we can, we can win deals. So that's how we're spending our time. And it's a challenging industry, but it's one that I've just, I've been in for a long time. Uh, and I feel like I've got a pretty good pulse on, on where doctors play. So you mentioned like what's, what's changing and evolving. I mean, are because your target market is a little bit behind on mm-hmm. the marketing side, uh, is it a little more stable? Like, are you able to kind of stick with your bread and butter or are you still having, are, are the tools and the mediums uh, and the techniques still rapidly evolving for how you reach out? Great question. Um, it changes over time. We're super measured in the way that we we reach out to physicians. We're, we're very much a hypothesis driven sales and marketing team, right? We make some assumptions around what each channel is going to bring back. We run small experiments. We wait until they're consistent and then we, we, we put more money towards it. So we're always trying things new, right? We're, we're trying different data. We're trying different channels. Um, we know that when we get tied up with a partner, uh, we have a lot of success. So to the extent that we can continue to build our partnership program, we know that is the fastest, easiest, and best way to get to our customers. So um, we're always experimenting, but so far there haven't been rapid changes in the way that physicians find us. Um, I would say where there have been rapid changes is in um, what physicians want from a product. So we're out there, we have a strong product team, and we're trying to understand from our customers, how, are, how do we be nimble in the market? How do we make sure that someone else doesn't come out um, with a new module or a new product and beat us to market with that? So I, I think one thing I'm really proud of is our customer success and operations team just spend a lot of time talking to our customers and making sure that they're happy and we understand exactly what they want next from patient Bob. Um, just because someone is younger, so you, you got a brand new, you know, 28 year old physician sure. versus a 50 year old physician been in practice, you know, two decades. Yep. Um, just because they're younger, is it, is it safe to assume they understand this online stuff better? Or is it still, it's like, maybe they just been in school the whole time and yeah, they, they may be cool doing a selfie, but yeah. they still don't know jack crap about marketing. Yeah, I would say even though you might assume that that younger physician knows more, it's just untrue, right? Like, um, it's like any other average person, I guess, of of different who doesn't play in the marketing space. Uh, The way that SEO and the way that search engine marketing and social media advertising and conversion rates and you know, trip wires and, you know, calls to action, the way that all that stuff works is, is kind of confusing. And, you know, I'm still learning about it every day and I've been in it forever. So I don't find a a, a huge differentiation between uh, ages of physicians and their, their understanding. I think the, the different, the difference I see is understanding why it's important. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the younger physicians tend to say like, yeah, I, I get it, man. People are online, like, get into the demo versus like having to massage and need sort of the, the mind of, of the older physician to say like, hey, people are making choices online and right. if you can't get them to believe that, then what the heck are we doing on the demo? Yeah. How do you get your salespeople to be confident with this, you know, in the presence of this almighty physician who has the power of God to heal you. You know, the yeah. only time you see salespeople, at least in the beginning, kind of grovel, right? Oh, I'm not, I'm not worthy to talk to this CEO there. man, that's a big C-level executive. This is a high power physician. Like they, yeah. you know, they, they wake up, put their pants on one leg at a time, just like us, you know, it's a person. Yep. Stepwise you know? growth. Yeah. Like growth, stepwise career growth. So what I mean is, Um, very rarely do I hire somebody in and throw them into the fire without going through a specific uh, progression of steps. And so most of the the top performers on my team, they're spending six to 12 months just talking with receptionists, office managers, and trying to get the doctor on the phone. Um, Once they've done that, the next thing they're doing is spending a few months doing discovery, teeing that up for somebody else. Once they learn how to do discovery, they might jump on a call with their manager for the next three months and sit, sit, you know, side pit next to the manager and listen to the manager do that. And it's really building skills over time. Like what I've found is when somebody comes in fresh out of school into patient pop, and that's where I hire, I hire smart uh, young uh, folks out of school, you know, 21, 22 years old, 
come into our organization, we train them up well, we put them through a boot camp, and then we give them that gradual progression over time. And I think that's where the confidence comes in. Like an idea that confidence comes with age to me has always been silly. Uh, confidence comes with experience and um, actually doing the thing that you're going to be doing for a living. So talking with physicians, having hard conversations. And then lastly, it's, it's education internally. So it's making sure that people have gone through a robust enough product training where if someone asks a super confusing question about search engine marketing, that they know how to answer that question. And what I've seen is that by putting people through stepwise growth, by giving them education, by making them confident in the product, the combination of those three things generally yields a really confident young salesperson who is ready to talk to physicians regardless of age, experience, or tenure. So this stepwise growth, is that, I've never heard of that before. Is that a, a methodology or did y'all invent that or what? I mean, not really. I guess it's just, it's a confusing way of saying. Um, no, it makes sense. I mean, it's like, it's like a journeyman, right? Like in a union, right? Like learning the crafts, they, they yeah. grow up through the ranks and you're basically, you're doing the same thing. Totally. That, that's the way that I think about it is like, oftentimes when I've been at previous companies, um, you start at one role and then you move to the next role and it's like significantly different, Right. And to me, it's like, why don't we just feed, feed these folks a little bit at a time so that they're getting better every month, every quarter, every year, and they're not biting off more than they can chew. I mean, man, you could tell people 10 things at once are going to absorb about one or two of them. And to me, it doesn't make sense to throw a ton of new information at someone and assume because they were good in the last role, they're going to be good in the next one. To me, it's like, let's, let's do it stepwise, incrementally, you know, uh, small steps at a time. How do you split up sales training versus product training? Mm. You know, culture training. Because it sounds like you're big on culture. You're big on, on learning the products. How do you, yeah. you know, find that right mix of, you know, Miller Hyman or Dale Carnegie or Sandler Sales or whatever? Yeah. My, my sales enablement uh, person and team is, is Sandler trained, but I don't think that really answers your question. I think what we do is we come in and before we product train, we company train. Like you're going to know in the first week of being a patient pop ready, whether or not you're ready to be as obsessed about our business as we are. And part of that is going into our mission, vision, values, giving you the backstory of who we are and why we are, and then learning about our customer. Like before you're going to learn about our product or our modules or whatever, conversion rates doesn't matter. Like you're going to learn about our customer why being a physician is getting harder and harder every single solitary year. And then you're going to learn about our product. And uh, you're going to get a combination of a few things. You're going to get classroom training, but really it's that tribal training. It's, it's literally sitting alongside of multiple people who are doing your role, have done your role, and have done more than your role in learning attached at the hip to that group of people. So my AEs, for example, they don't just close business. They don't just generate business. They coach. They're coaches. They're mentors. And they spend a good amount of time out of their week training new people during the selling day. And we have found that that kind of connection and that kind of training downstream from, from your initial enablement training is just really, really effective in getting people ramped up in 60 days. So it's awesome. How does a small company, though, I mean, that like margins are so tight, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. I, I got to hire somebody. It's Friday. I got to hire, they got to start on Monday and they got to start making me money. Yeah. You know, but you know, I can't have them sit and, and, and shadow someone for 60 days before they're productive. I mean, how sure. do you, how do you evolve into that? Right. Because that's the reality of most businesses. I mean, they don't have a recruiting mentality. They, they're running fire drills because their top performer is recruited away probably by you. Right. Yeah. So, um, how do you, how do they make that, that shift, you know, to have that process? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, maybe I, I probably should have been a bit more clear around what they're doing, but, uh, in their first 60 days, they are, they are being productive. So generally they'll come in and before they're closing real business, they're at least generating enough opportunities 
to help somebody else close a lot more business. And they're usually hip to hip to that person, right? Actually generating business for that person and then attending that demonstration, learning about that product. So it, it isn't just um, sitting around and watching for 60 days. It's taking the sales hours that you have in a day and trying to tribal train as much as you can all day by hip to hip uh, contact and making sure that you're listening to calls, generating business, scheduling the demos, doing the discovery in real time with your AE counterpart. And to me, like there's a couple of different ways you could look at it. It's really expensive to have somebody who's not closing net new revenue sitting in a seat all the time, but there is nothing more expensive than churning through a bunch of people trying to find one really great sales closer. And if you were to rewind three, four years ago to when I started at Patient Pop, gosh, no, four and a half years ago, um, I did that. Like I, I hired people and I, I couldn't get them trained up and it wasted time and it was super frustrating. And so now I've got this, this pod system where people are training each other and the confidence levels are, are so high that I can get productivity, confidence, and future gains out of putting them in that situation versus allowing them to fail. Very cool, man. Well, this is awesome. What should people do next, man? Where do we, where do we send them? Huh? You got your own website now? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, started, uh, I started my own website about a year ago. And um, what I've been really just doing is, well, you know, when you and I last talked, I was tiny little uh, $3 million company up to 50 million and learned a lot of lessons. So I've just been writing about those lessons online and, and what I've learned every week uh, running a business of this size. And you can find that at justindwelsh.com. That's Welsh with an S. And you can find me on Twitter at Justin Sass, S-A-A-S. And then I'm super active on LinkedIn. You'll see me there every day, just chatting with people and sharing best practices. So you can follow me. I'm, I'm Justin Welsh on, on LinkedIn. All right. Very cool. Well, you got to come to Temecula, man. Do a little wine taste and bring the family, whatever. I absolutely uh, will. And, and hopefully next time we talk, either there will be uh, less uh, time in between or more growth in between, <laughs> or, or hopefully uh, uh, both. But always enjoy doing your show, Wes. Uh, I'm not just a guest, but I'm a listener, man. So I listen to your, your episodes and I love them. So keep up the great work and always appreciate you having me on. Hey, man, flattery will get you everywhere, all right? Figured as much. <laughs> all right, man, have a great day. Thanks, Wes. You as well. So what did I tell you, huh? Good stuff. I love the fact he's got 105 people in sales. Man, look, nothing happens until a sale is made. So understand that. And we're all in sales. I don't care what your role is, you're in sales. You need to understand how that impacts your perception in the marketplace, uh, how anybody that comes into contact with a prospect or uh, a customer, how they are in sales, how they can move the needle towards or away from you. Um, I love how he talks about he likes to find talent that is happy where they are killing it. So you have to go out and steal from your competition. That's life in the big city. Don't yeah, Just because somebody... They have a resume that they used to sell. They have sold well. Doesn't mean they will sell well for you. Go find great people and entice them to you. Uh, I thought that was really important. Um, I love the way that uh, they have things broken down for their sales development, inside sales, partner sales, field sales. Um, top performers should rob from the bottom. You see this all the time in companies where you get the turkeys and that's where Management spends all their time and effort. Let the turkeys languish. They will figure out how to grow and do what needs to be done or they'll leave. And then you don't have to pay workers um, unemployment, right? It sounds brutal, but it's just life in the big city. Focus on your top performers. Give them more tools to succeed. You know, it's basically positive and negative reinforcement. You can spank the bad children, or you can heap praise and love on the good ones and the misbehaving children will soon figure out, hey, if I want mommy and daddy's attention, I need to act like the good children. And they will. That's what you do with your salespeople as well. Be smart about that. I've got a program. Uh, I really rarely talk about it. It's short. It's simple. 
Uh, it's called No More Sales Duds, nomoresalesduds.com. It talks about how to recruit, how to run ads, how to screen salespeople, because you, you hire and onboard and screen salespeople differently than other positions. You're looking for the tough, the those with empathy. You're looking for those that are going to not wither just because you give them, put a little pressure on them. All right, so it's different. So go check that out, nomoresalesduds.com. And then another program that is pretty new for me, I've partnered with a, a really sharp guy, got a great team providing CRM support. Uh, and, you know, Patient Pop is basically delivering a business in a box, and that includes a CRM uh, under the hood for their doctors to manage and segment their, their patients, their leads, but I've got a program at the CRM Butler, so the CRMButler.com. So we provide for a flat fee, unlimited support on Infusionsoft, Active Campaign, and HubSpot. The HubSpot platform is, of course, a little more expensive, um, but you get more with it insofar as uh, consulting and some social media uh, management, reputation management and some SEO work. But um, check those out, the crmbutler.com. I'll be continuously tweaking that page. We're going to be adding some tutorials and videos on that. But you can order right now, super affordable. Uh, on the Infusionsoft and uh, Active Campaign platforms, there's no contract. On the HubSpot platform right now, uh, there's no onboarding fee, but there is a 90-day minimum. Uh, and then after that 90 days, it is uh, month to month. We'll probably probably be adding uh, an onboarding a setup fee on the HubSpot side and then go month to month. But um, we're just testing some things now. It's just such a beefier platform. Uh, usually when people come to us with HubSpot help, it's just much more complex because it does so many more things. You know, basically, you know, the other platforms are kind of like, I don't know, re remodeling a an apartment versus remodeling an apartment complex. You know, there's just more to it. But yeah, check that out. If you have any questions, hit me up. You know how to reach me online. I am pretty accessible anywhere you're hanging out online. So hey, thanks for listening. Please be sure to leave a five-star review. Let me know that you're out there. Uh, subscribe. Share this podcast with others. It helps the numbers go up. The more the numbers go up, the more leads and business I get. The more leads and business I get, the more I can give of myself freely on this kind of platform and on the implementers page on the private group. All right. So thanks for listening. I'll go sell something. <laughs> <laughs>